Hello everyone, welcome back to Poetry Surprises and uh, today we're going to hopefully enjoy uh, three more poems from the sequence 13 Souls in Search of a Light Switch. Now, if you remember, there are 13 souls locked in a kind of time warp in a chapel in Western France. It is pitch black inside. There is only the occasional flickering of light and intrusion of sound out through the narrow gaps of the windows of the chapel, which people can pick up as they walk past, put their ear to the wall and hear the souls searching for their light switch. And each soul tells its story. Well, we're going to have three souls today. We're going to have Madame Spock. Madame Spock visits Earth and discovers a planet in captivity to its own horrendous nightmares. <clears throat> and she makes a getaway. Then we're going to have John Dalton, the physicist from the 19th century, who used to play parlour games uh, as a way of raising money, actually, uh, for his experiments and his initiatives. And uh, I don't know if you know, but the parlour game that uh, you can play is if you create a bell jar around an alarm clock and you suck all the air out, the sound of the alarm has no medium through which to travel, so it gradually falls silent. It was, a, I think, a, 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 a fascinating piece of showmanship for a, 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 a mind who advanced 19th century science. And we're going to end with a spyug. Yes, the Venerable Bede Sparrow. And in between, I'm going to tell you a few stories. So for now, let's just get going. Let's have the first poem. Madam Spock visits Earth. I saw your star, charted fluctuations in emitted light, transit of rocky bodies, trained dishes and lenses, picked up signals, faint but ordered, heard a call for help. My governments agreed to send a starship, assist you in your dark hour. After years of lightning travel, my eyes newly opened from interstellar slumber, I found you cowered on an hospitable planet, your weapons pointed at me. I turned retreated to a distance beyond the sense of your instruments and watched. Towels of conquest, crisis and endurance beam across your globe, play out on screens inside skeletons of concrete. Such fears are something that my people lost when our forebears enshrined reason and harmony in the creed. However, your towels, their alien races and impossible inventions, struck a resonance, awakening a child in me, a soul searching for a light switch. The chapel itself had no electricity and uh, it was quite isolated. Uh, there were two fields between it and another chapel nearer the town. I had to work out a way to get electricity between um, the town and this chapel. Um, I, I raised the issue with the mayor. I said, well, you know, there's kind of, we've got everything ready, but there's no electricity. Oh, oh, but that's the chapel de San Wen. Yes, well, there's no electricity in the chapel de San Wen. I said, well, yes, I know, but you said there could be. Oh, did I? Yes. Ah, oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, don't worry. We'll get, we'll get electricity to the Chapel de saint -Wen. So a day passed and not much was happening. And I was thinking, well, uh, hopefully they're not going to put a generator outside because you won't be able to hear anything. 
And then suddenly uh, I was told to go to the chapel, two fields opposite. And um, uh, the mayor came down and opened the back of her car. And in the boot of the car were 10 rouleaux, as the French call them, rolls, cable, cable rolls. Uh, you know, the ones where you plug in and you extend. Uh, there, there was 10 of them. She said, I think these are stretch. Uh, I said, oh, well, uh, fine. So she said, well, plug it into the wall. So from the other chapel, which did have electricity, we plug in the wall and we stretch out and get into the field, go through the barbed wire. And there's me and the mayor running across, connecting things up. And uh, we're in the middle of the field. And uh, uh, she says to me, oh, she said, I told the farmer to get the cows out of the field. I said, yeah. And she said, well, don't look behind you, but I think he's forgotten. And there was this herd of cows staring at me. I'd, I'd, I'd never laid cables so quickly uh, because they were curious and they did have horns because the French don't always cut the horns off. So um, there we were, plugging, stretching, plugging, stretching, plugging, stretching, and luckily... The, uh, the, the power cable did reach, believe it or not, that chapel that you saw at the beginning. Uh, and um, all we had to hope for was the cows were removed because if one of them had trod on one of those plugs, it would have probably electrocuted it, actually. It was a terrible thing to say. But anyway, uh, um, you know, the will was there and it happened and uh, uh, lots of people did get to experience this installation uh, but it was a bit uh, touch and go at times anyway time for the next poem john, john dalton's alarm i made my entrance the magician more animated than wedgwood's frolics smoother than the polished aspidistra ladies admired my youth men my ingenuity and learning. With a flourish, I primed a carriage clock, set it down to surprise with its alarm. Each genteel soul watched another, curious, expectant, as I placed the ringing timepiece beneath a dimpled bell jar, pumped every breath from inside its dome. The tiny clapper frantically tapped, but faded to a mute toxin. I bowed before my public. In the pools before applause, each stared ahead, alone, gulped stuffy, homely air as if winded, knowing with certainty of witness an emptiness that renders parlour games a charade, polite laughter, the mimed screams of savants in bedlam. Ah, a bit of gothic horror to uh, end that poem, uh, sort of bedlam vision. Um, now we're going to go way, way back. Uh, in fact, here we are, I'm going to um, tell you about the Venerable Bede. There's a little note in the book. A cleric who lived in Northumbria in England in the Dark Ages. The Venerable Bede, 672 to 735, is credited with a story that compares the life of a human with the brief flight of a sparrow. Uh, but I was actually more interested in the sparrow, really. So that's why I had the sparrow answer for himself, rather than... Uh, have uh, the pontifications of Mr. Bede, uh, or as the sparrow calls him, the vulnerable Bede. Um, uh, and so let's hear the sparrow's take. The venerable Bede's sparrow. And so I came and went, and in that brief flight gave birth to legend, a simple metaphor that carried no meaning for me, but bore weight, it seems, for the vulnerable bead. It was instinct. I headed for light, got a fright. Raucous laughter, stench of owl and flaming faggots winged me through the nearest window. Fluttering to a branch, I waited till dawn. 
chilly but cheerful. I never liked foraging around humans, but was on the lookout, as cheeky sparrows are, for a crumb, a warm cornice, and by chance gave generations a towel to lighten the otherwise dark ages. I didn't last the winter, froze on a branch slowly at sunset. Not so short as to be a painless life, not bitter either. It's no skin off my beak that the vulnerable bead kiss his cotton habit, took history and heaven's credit, while all I did was breed in privet.